everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. I'm Carrie Greif, the Curator of Educational Programs for the Decorative Arts Trust, and I am thrilled that you are here for a very special dialogue featuring Maury Gallagher and Medill Higgins. Harvey, they're going to be discussing the research that they did on Edward Seymour for the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and I am sure it's going to be a very compelling conversation. Um, if you enjoy this program, please make sure to come back uh, for a panel discussion that we are hosting featuring auction houses later on this month. Um, and if you would like to see more uh, videos from the Decorative Arts Trust and see uh, more of these virtual dialogues, go ahead and check out our YouTube page and uh, maybe even subscribe. Um, so without further ado, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Maury Gallagher. Moira is a graduate of James Madison University. She received her BA in art history and holds an MA in the history of decorative arts from George Mason University and the Smithsonian Associates. She has previously held positions with Sumter Pretty the uh, Third, Inc. and at James Madison's Montpelier. She joined the American Wing in 2014 and conducts research on the Met's collection of American decorative arts. Her presentation tonight comes from her recent work on the forthcoming catalog and feature exhibition, Collecting Inspiration, Edward C. Moore and Tiffany and Co. She has also contributed to various museum publications and special exhibitions, including Jewelry, The Body Transformed in 2018, and Artistic Furniture of the Gilded Age in 2015, as well as the ins installation of the Warsham Rockefe Rockefeller Dressing Room at the Metropolitan. Uh, so uh, without further ado, Maura, go ahead and take it away. Great, thank you so much, Carrie, and uh, thank you to everyone for joining us tonight. So let me just get this PowerPoint situation set up for us and we'll get going. All righty. So I just wanna express my thanks again to Matt Thurlow, Carrie, and the whole Decorative Arts Trust for inviting me here tonight to share with you a little bit of the research that I contributed to the forthcoming publication, Collecting Inspiration, Edward Seymour at Tiffany and Company, um, which was edited by Medill Higgins Harvey, who led the project and will be joining me in conversation later this evening. The book was set to originally accompany an exhibition by the same title that was to open at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in July of 2020. But unfortunately, the show has been postponed due to the COVID-19 pandemic, but we are so excited that its publication uh, will be available to audiences this summer, and we're looking forward to have it, having it out in about June or July of this year. So Collecting Inspiration explores the artistic vision and legacy of Edward C. Moore, who's pictured here at the right, who served as the head of Tiffany & Company's Silver Manufacturing Division during the latter half of the 19th century. It was under Moore's leadership that the firm achieved unparalleled success on a global stage with its fresh and original designs that were executed through new and innovative technical processes. And at the left, you can see just a few examples of their work from that period that really reflect the variety of forms and decorative motifs developed under Moore's tenure. And you can also see how the firm made incredible advancements in techniques of enameling, Japanese inspired mixed metal techniques and patination methods. To fuel this creative energy and to inspire his team of designers, Edward Moore amassed an amazing collection of decorative arts objects from across the world. And you can see a small selection of those on the screen now. The collection features a rich variety of media and represents the artistic accomplishments of ancient Greece and Rome, modern Europe, Asia, and the Islamic world. Totaling over 2000 objects and about 500 books at the time of Moore's death in 1891, the collection was given to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and here you can see it installed at the museum in the early 20th century. It's no longer shown as a single unit, but is now held between six different curatorial departments and the Watson Library. This transformative gift continues to inspire our visitors today, and collecting inspiration will bring together for the very first time a selection of objects from Moore's collection and works from Tiffany and Company that they inspired. In my remarks tonight, I'll give you a brief introduction into Edward Moore and his collection and share some of the research that I contributed to help contextualize more within the broader network of European and American collectors during this time. And lastly, to wrap us up, we'll take a deep dive into one of the silver objects that's featured in the exhibition catalog 
to explore how Moore's collection inspired production at Tiffany's. Edward Moore, who's depicted here at around 1885, began his career as a New York City silversmith in 1849, when he joined his father as a partner in his firm, John C. Moore and Son. The family firm was known for its well-designed and beautifully executed silver hollowware, including this silver tea service that was presented to Marshall Lefferts for his efforts in advancing the telegraph system in New York. And this is now held in the Met's collection and the Museum of the City of New York. Shortly after Edward joined his father's firm, Tiffany & Company, who was then one of New York City's premier fancy goods and jewelry retailers, made an exclusive arrangement with that father-son team to become the sole retailer of their finely crafted silver. Tiffany & Company, which is shown here at their 550 Broadway store location that opened in 1854, was rapidly expanding their enterprise and that they sought out the Moore firm to be their exclusive wholesaler of silver bears witness to the Moore's highly regarded reputation in the field. Edward quickly rose to prominence and was recognized early on for his creative designs and leadership. A lengthy account of Tiffany's showroom was published in the New York Daily Tribune shortly after the 550 Broadway store opened. It went on to describe the firm's nearby manufacturing facilities, which were actually the Moore workshop. It described them as, quote, the silverware manufactory of Mr. Tiffany and Company is under the immediate superintendence of Mr. Edward C. Moore. The establishment gives work to about 100 first-class journeyman silversmiths. Mr. Moore, in addition to superintending the workmen, makes original designs for almost every article manufactured." End quote. About a decade later, Tiffany formally incorporated and acquired the Moore firm in exchange for cash and stock in the company. Moore Silver Manufactory, which was then located at 53 and 55 Prince Street, which you can see here, was now officially part of Tiffany & Company, and it became the firm's creative hub. As a young craftsman who was at the center of New York City's industrial transformation from small shop production to large-scale manufacturing, Edward Moore that was keenly aware that despite the city and the industry's growth, there was a severe lack of formal artistic training and public art viewing available to members of the artisan class. Institutions like the Met weren't there, and there were very few formal art schools. And while there were things like mechanics and tradesmen's libraries, they had very limited resources. To remedy this dilemma though, Moore began collecting the artistic products of various times and places to inspire the craftsmen at Tiffany. He structured a rigorous apprenticeship program at the firm and held his staff to the highest possible standards. Under his leadership, Tiffany Silver came to dominate the global market. It won top awards at international fairs and courted an elite clientele that included a range from European nobility to American industrialists and those who aspired to such social achievement. Period accounts suggest that Moore began assembling this collection in the 1860s. Unlike many of his contemporaries, Moore wasn't building his collection as a statement of cultural or financial achievement but really as a practical tool. Medill has classified Moore as a formalist in his practice, and as such, line, color, texture, shape, and method of construction of the object all held equal artistic merit in his eyes. Over the next 30 years, he simultaneously collected contemporary and historic objects and bought masterpieces right alongside everyday tourist products. He was never giving a single medium, geographic region, or time period his sole focus. The range of quality that we observe in the Moore collection, at least as assessed by today's connoisseurial standards, really speaks to how Moore viewed each object as worthy of study. Many of his objects are now iconic masterpieces of the Met's collection, including this um, 13th century brazier with silver inlay and yellow decoration that you see on the left that was made for the Rasulid court, which in, is in present day Yemen. Other objects though, like the small molded terracotta lamp, one of about 15 that survives in the collection is considered kind of modest by today's um, connoisseurial standards. Regardless of its scale, Moore brought all of these objects to Tiffany's Prince Street studio. And here you can see a picture of the design room there dated to about 1885. All along that back wall, you can see rows and rows of reference books and objects. In the case to the left, you can see a selection of Japanese baskets on the bottom shelf. And on the top, there's a range of Islamic glassware. 
And we've actually been able to identify some of these objects as now being in the Met's collection. It was in this room that Tiffany's designers would explore the world beyond their Manhattan factory. And they began to digest the various patterns, motifs, textures, and shapes into their designs for silverware. While the exhibition and publication are certainly centered around the story of Tiffany and Company Silver, our research also aimed to answer questions about the origins of Morse Collection, which you can see here installed at the Met in 1894. Our principal goal was to answer just where, when, and how did Moore amass this, these holdings. In the 130 years since the Moore Collection arrived at the Met, the museum had only been able to identify some provenance beyond Moore for just a small number of works in the collection. It was my job, though, to take a fresh look at this research and see if we couldn't figure out some more details. We were able to make some really exciting connections that allowed us to better understand Moore's unique position within the history of non-Western collecting, particularly of non-Western art. Edward Moore left us no known cache of personal or professional correspondence. So as all you other researchers out there know, we had to get pretty creative when it came to coming up with source material to piece the story together. I used everything at my, that I could get my hands on from census records and newspaper articles, periodicals, archives at the Met, archives at Tiffany and Company, Moore's library holdings, and of course the collection itself uh, to build out his story and really come to understand his world. Through all of that, I was able to connect more to a global network of international exhibitions, retail establishments, auctions, museums, private collectors, diplomats, scholars, and artists, all of whom brought more into contact with objects from across the globe. An early clue in our research was this 1908 letter that's held in the Met's archives. It was written by Moore's son, Edward Moore Jr., to museum officials who had written requesting more information about the origins of his father's collection. And you can see at the beginning of the second paragraph, he writes, quote, I regret that I cannot give much information about the objects, end quote. While a disappointing start to the letter, he does go on on page two to say that his father acquired Islamic glass and ceramics from other well-known um, 19th century European collectors and specifically named Caspar Perdon Clark, Albert Goupil, Charles Schaefer, George Salting, and Alessandro Castellani as sources of Morse collection. He also listed the names of other well-known British and French art dealers, but did include names of lesser known figures and those were still researching. Moore's connection to some of those 19th century European collectors had long been suspected. For example, four examples of ancient glass from Moore's collection, two of which I'm showing you here on the left, had been identified as coming from the collection of Alessandro Castellani, which was auctioned in a two-part sale held in Rome and Paris in the spring of 1884. Now, without sales receipts or written documentation, we can't say absolutely that Moore bought them at the sale, but our research suggests that this was highly probable since copies of the Castellani sale catalogs were amongst the library holdings that Moore included in his gift to the Met. This collection of books had previously never been considered in conjunction with the collection itself, but it became an integral part to our understanding of where Moore's collected objects came from and really just understanding the academic world that he inhabited. We suspect that Moore may have attended the Castellani sales himself, since we know he traveled to Europe almost annually. He would frequently visit Paris and London where Tiffany had branch stores, in addition to making various trips to attend the International World's Fairs on behalf of Tiffany and company. He could have purchased the objects also through an art agent, and we suspect that was most likely his good friend, the art dealer Samuel P. Avery, who we know served as a pallbearer at Moore's funeral and is listed as the New York agent in both of the Castellani sale catalogs. And Avery's name also appears in numerous other books and auction catalogs that are held in Moore's library. In that 1908 letter though, Moore Jr. specifically acknowledged that his father acquired Islamic objects from Castellani and didn't mention the ancient glass. So this made us wonder what else were we sort of missing that Moore may have acquired from the renowned Italian collector. We turn to a newly analyzed inventory of Moore's collection that was held in the Met's archives. It dates to just about the time of the bequest and specifically described this luster bottle on the left and the 18th century bowl on the right as two artworks that Moore somehow acquired from Castellani. Neither object matches entries in the 1884 sale catalogs, so we know that Moore acquired them through some other means. 
When one considers that Moore and the Castellani family, who were well-known jewelers during the, this time, both shared a deep passion for utilizing objects from the past to inspire contemporary artistic production, it seems probable the two men may have had a more personal friendship. We'd also long suspected that Moore purchased objects when he traveled to the various international world's fairs that he attended on behalf of Tiffany and company, but we really couldn't pin down a specific object. In 1893 newspaper article covering Moore's bequest to the Met did highlight a damascened plate that Moore purportedly purchased from the 1873 Vienna exhibition. With this information, we went to our colleague, associate curator of Islamic art, Denise Bay, is it? who identified a couple of the objects in Moore's collection that fit the description. And one of them I'm showing you here, which features a beautiful, delicate gold thread damascened into the steel tray. Well, you can absolutely imagine our shock <laughs> and amazement when we went to see the object for the first time in our photo studio and turned it over and saw this incredible label on the back of the object, which in fact confirms that it was the object Moore purchased in Vienna in 1873. And you can even see it notes that it was from um, the display brought by India. We had some really interesting conversations with Denise about the description of it as a card tray, suggesting that it was intended for the Western market. Well, this is certainly an incredible discovery and one of many that we made during our research for the show. One of my absolute favorite research projects though was coming to a better understanding of Moore's relationship with one of his sons named William P. Moore. My research revealed that William was an active art dealer in New York and was a key part of his father's collecting activities. William began his career at Tiffany's, but with his father's financial backing, he started his own bric-a-brac business in 1877, the first known ad of which I'm showing you here. The inventory of Chinese and Japanese objects that he was advertising were to be presented to the New York market a full month before Tiffany would go on to offer their famed auction of items brought back from Japan by the British designer, Christopher Dresser really showing that William was at the top of his game in bringing non-Western art to the New York market. In his later advertisements, William would promote his own travels to Europe and Asia, and was always sure to highlight that he acquired his inventory directly from sources abroad. By the 1880s, William's business had evolved from a retail operation into an auction establishment known as Moore's Art Gallery. He continued to import a variety of goods and hosted the first sales offered in the United States by Siegfried Bing in 1887, and that's the address seeing on the screen here. A diary entry written by a Tiffany Company employee named Charles Grosjean, who served as Moore's sort of number two man at the Prince Street factory, confirms that William often purchased items on his father's behalf. In an entry dated 1881, Grosjean describes a Persian luster bottle that Edward Moore had brought to the design room and noted that Moore had paid 1300 for it, but quote, Will had asked 1500 for it and paid 1100 in Paris for it, end quote. Unfortunately, Will, William predeceased his father, dying in 1890 at the young age of 36. When his father died just about a year later, one obituary commented on their shared legacy. It stated, quote, his son, William P. Moore, had inherited his father's artistic inclinations to a truly remarkable degree. Young Moore was one of the best judges of porcelains and oriental glass I'd ever met, end quote. The contents of William's own collection remains unknown, but I can't help but wonder that if after his death, some of his objects found his way into his father's hands. So now that you have a bit of context about Moore and, and his collection, I want to turn to how, to how it shaped um, silver production at Tiffany and Company. And here you can just see an incredible selection of objects produced under Moore's tenure. So scholars had long been aware that Moore's extensive collection existed and that it had influence on production at Tiffany's. And so when Medill first began the project, she expected that we'd find a number of sort of one-to-one -one comparisons between the Tiffany silver objects and those in the Moore collection, such as this previously published comparison between a bronze Japanese brush pot in Moore's collection, which you're seeing from two different angles here at the center and on the right, and this silver Japanese vase uh, by Tiffany dated to 1877 that's now in the collection of the Brooklyn Museum. You can of course see that the central element of the silver vase mirrors that of the brush pot, both in its form and decorative scheme. Surprisingly, though, our analysis revealed that this correspondence may in fact be a pretty rare example of such a one-to-one -one comparison. 
Overall, the surviving body of Tiffany and Company's work from this period reflects Moore and his team's artistic practice was much more sensitive and often blended multiple sources of inspiration from across objects, across cultures, and across times to create something that was really entirely new. Take, for example, the small mustard pot made by Tiffany's and held in the Met's collection. And again, you can kind of see it, you can see it here from two different angles. Designed in 1879 and standing at just over three inches in height, it has a square shape with a baluster profile, four little OG feet, a serpentine handle, and a hinged lid. Its decoration, which is detailed here, is composed of irregular patches of mixed metal ornament, ranging in tone from soft yellow to rich brown and black. On first pass, it just struck us as a really creative and colorful example of Tiffany's Japanese silver, which was a style that was incredibly popular amongst their clients in the 1870s and 80s and often praised in the period press. In its form, one can draw comparisons to the small 19th century Japanese iron vase with gilded decoration from Moore's collection. But its decoration certainly captures the firm's experimental work in exploring Japanese mixed metal techniques. We know that Moore devoted an enormous amount of time and energy into understanding and replicating the mixed metal techniques that he and his colleagues were observing on Japanese objects. By understanding how Japanese artisans created such a wide range of colors in their metalwork, Moore hoped to bring a similar variety of color to the traditionally monochromatic medium of silver. But we really wanted to get at and understand what these experiments were that Tiffany was conducting and how they um, impacted the appearance of something like our mustard pot. So we consulted our colleague, research scientist, Federico Caro, and he conducted X-ray fluorescence spectroscopy on our mustard pot, or a process better known as XRF. His analysis identified the material composition of each section, revealing a sterling silver body, gold used for the yellow passages, and copper used on the brown sections. But his findings for the black sections were somewhat surprising to us. He found that although indistinguishable to the naked eye today, the section actually contained two distinctive metal alloys, a copper, platinum, iron alloy in some parts, and in others, a copper gold alloy that closely resembled the composition of Japanese shikudo. Here you can see an example of Japanese shikudo on the carp fish on this iron suba or sword guard that's in the Moore collection. Composed of copper and gold, the metal is frequently patinated to achieve the desired effect of a rich black color that is often compared to um, the surface quality of lacquer. But this left us wondering, why would the Tiffany silversmiths use two different materials to ultimately arrive at the same visual effect? So we returned to our research to see if we couldn't find some answers and two sources proved to be invaluable. The first was a series of diaries authored by Charles Grosjean that I referenced earlier. In his notebooks, he recorded the details about their experiments to achieve what he referred to as the quote, blue black color that they observed in Japanese shikudo. In April of 1878, just about a year before the mustard pot was designed, Grosjean wrote about how his fellow Tiffany and Company employee, Richard Dimes, had assayed an example of shikudo that they found on a Japanese plaque that was brought to the design room. Here you can see an excerpt from the diary where Grosjean writes, Mr. Dimes is still trying to produce the blue black shikudo. Within a month's time from the entry, Dimes had successfully replicated the metal and achieved the desired visual effect of the surface with chemical patination. Grosjean, Grosjean goes on in his diary to describe how this new approach was first used to color the hardware of a lady's purse in Chatelaine. Unfortunately, though, the coloration was eventually rubbed off the purse's hardware, resulting in a very frustrated client. The workshop had to then refinish the piece and continue their experiments to find a more stable treatment. The second document that shed some light on the mustard pot was the surviving technical manual that records various chemical and metallurgic recipes used at the Tiffany workshop during Moore's tenure. The copper gold alloy that we identified on the pot corresponds exactly to the recipe you see at the top left in the manual, as which is identified as shikudo. The entry on the right describes it as blue-black in color and says it's the same material that was used to create the lady's purse in 1878. As with the purse though, 
Portions of the patination have rubbed off over time on the mustard pot to reveal the copper substrate. And you can sort of absorb that, or excuse me, observe that um, kind of right in the center of that black section. The other alloy of the mustard pot um, that Federico identified as the copper, platinum, and iron alloy matches the recipe listed below for metal number 47. And that is described as being, quote, black, not blue black in color. This subtle yet marked difference in tonal quality suggests that what we now see as a monochromatic section was originally intended to have two distinctive colors. And while this small distinction may not seem that revolutionary, it completely transformed how we viewed the mustard pot and its sources of inspiration. While certainly inspired by Japanese objects in its form and decorative composition, we now understood that the mustard pot was originally meant to have sort of a swirling matrix of colors in its decoration. This immediately brought to mind for us Moore's rich collection of Greek and Roman mosaic glass. He has an impressive collection that included rare and many rare vessels, including the lidded pyxis at the top right and the large bowl that imitates agate on the lower right. His collection also has a number of glass, small glass fragments, which were incredibly popular amongst 19th century collectors. While the mustard part is just, pot is just one of many examples we discuss in the catalog, it really exhibits how Moore and his designers and silversmiths utilized his collections. They experimented, they learned from these materials, they drew from the aesthetics and brought all of that inspiration together to create new and refreshing compositions. While the resulting silver works are deeply indebted to their sources of inspiration, they are without a doubt something entirely all their own. And with that, I would like to invite Medill to join me on screen. Medill, are you there? Yes. Medill is the Ruth Bigelow Riston Associate Curator of Decorative Arts at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. She has conceived of the Moore Project and has been its lead curator. Medill, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I am. I am thrilled to be here. I, I have to confess to obviously not being an impartial audience, but it is so much fun to, to get to go on this journey listening to you and being reminded of, of how much fun we, we had along the way. Thank you. I was hoping you could start us off tonight by talking a little bit more about how you came to know Edward Moore um, and some of your goals in bringing together the work for the exhibition and the publication that we worked on. Well, yeah, so I, I, I started to dip my toe into 19th century silver back in graduate school and in my, my first years working at the Met, I was pulling together lists of 19th century silver for the exhibition Art in the Empire City and stumbled not just across more, but across the fact that the Met had objects that he had collected. And so often we're trying to sort of imagine or piece together what people are looking at. And so I was absolutely fascinated that we had this collection and that that it seemed to have been very little studied. I mean, there have been some, some focused uh, work that has, has drawn on it to a certain extent, but the Met itself had never really done, had, since the objects were, were dispersed to various departments, had never been shown together, had never been discussed or um, explored in an exhibition. So I kind of filed it away and was uh, busy doing various other things, but it was the sort of the dream that I, that I held uh, fast that I really wanted to tell his story and to and to look at, at the role his collections played. And so a number of years ago, uh, pitched the idea to, to great enthusiasm. And that is what started us on, on this journey. And it, it really was lucky timing in a way because various departments that own his collections at the Met had in the course of telling their own histories started to stumble across this man, Edward Moore, who they'd never heard of, but if they, the, as the Asian department and the Islamic department were, were marking anniversaries, some of the earliest parts of their collection came from this man, Edward Moore. So I'd get a call saying, I see he's a silversmith, what's his story? So, so it was, it was well-timed as, as people were, were across the museum starting to be really interested in, in telling both the collecting story and the silver design story. Yeah, absolutely. I think they just dovetail together so well. It's it's not just a Met story. It's really this 
the story of 19th century silver in addition to parts of the Met's history as well um, and really bringing those two things together in an exciting way. Well, Maura, since we're, 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 we're chatting and I get to ask you questions uh, too, as I was, I, was, I was listening to you, it really brought me back to the moment when we aggregated all of this research and had to really think about the stories that ended up on the cutting room floor, the stories that made it into the book, the stories where we had a file of hundreds of pieces of paper and I ended up summarizing in two or three sentences uh, to make word count in the, in the book. And I think it would be fun to hear from you about the, the, the stories that didn't make it into the book and particularly the things that you would like to continue to explore and, and, and tell in, in other forms and venues. Oh man, well that is that's the long list, <laughs> you know that well. Um, so yeah, I mean, I feel like at every twist and turn in, the, in researching the story, we were always coming across a, a new name or um, a new connection that Moore had to somebody, some other well-known figure from the period. Um, you know, we referenced Siegfried Bing in the presentation, and I think that um, avenue has a bit more to sort of be teased out of um, from it. Obviously, um, his son had this connection with him, and we also know that his son, William, so I guess I'd have to say my short answer would be his son, William Moore. I think he's yeah. one of the most fascinating figures in the story and, and the least well known. Um, you know, he had relationships with Herder brothers and was auctioning off some of their um, collected objects over the course of the 1880s as well. Um, you know, I think one of the most rich resources, though, that I feel like with every page we turned, we were finding a new and exciting story were those, the diaries of Charles Grosjean. I mean, his detailed descriptions of some of the objects that were brought to the showroom that we or to the um, factory that we were able to identify in the collection were just amazing connections and he's referencing people and colleagues you know um, a man named um, Kinzaburo Yaye who worked for the first Japanese manufacturing and trading company you know we're just starting to learn more about him and his story um, yeah, so I think for me, it's like these individual narratives that who brought these objects to more and really sort of built that network of connections for him. I also think, you know, there's just so much great, you know, our colleagues at the Tiffany and Company archives have done such incredible work with their holdings. And, you know, there's just so many other little pieces that I felt like we could tease out along the way that would just be so fun to continue it, to, it, to it, allow. So sorry to. Oh <laughs> yeah, I could go on for days. That's the problem. Cut it, me off, please. It, no, not at all. It. Um, I do remember coming across the first reference to Siegfried Bing and having that be an, a real aha moment of of recognizing that the it's this is not just an American collecting story and and the, the extent to which he more was was so enmeshed in in European collecting uh, circles and. I don't know if you remember, but we were sitting down with our colleague, Monica Binchik, who's the curator of Japanese decorative arts. And her first reaction to the collection was, this feels not so much like a later 19th century American collection, but like a Par Parisian collection. And all of, all of that became, um, became a sort of interesting starting point, I think, for the way, the way we, we both were thinking about this. Yeah, I think it became clear to us that, you know, at every turn, Moore was really at the vanguard of this within the American context and positioning him at Tiffany's, which is, of course, also retailing imported goods. I mean, just creates this really um, amazing picture of what 19th century access to especially non-Western art was looking like and that he was really helping to shape that for many American collectors as well is just really impressive. You know, one of the things that always sort of surprised me in our, or not surprised me in our research, but I found really interesting was that the contemporary press really sort of heralded Tiffany and Moore for sort of almost creating a new American aesthetic um, in their work and, you know, um, sort of not just following in the steps of the Europeans um, as we had been doing for so long, but really sort of leading the way. Um, and I think as we look at these objects and Moore's collection, we really see that part of that was coming out of Moore's practice of this close looking and drawing upon um, sources of inspiration from across cultures and time periods um, and really integrating that into his work and his, um, and his creative process. But I was hoping you could talk a little bit about how that drawing from other 
cultures and objects, you know, especially non-Western objects as a Western silversmith, um, how that work fits into the context of, a, you know, contemporary conversations we're having about um, cultural appropriation and, and where more and Tiffany sort of fit into that conversation a little bit. I think that's just a, such a fascinating part of this work. Well, as you know, we've had a lot of interesting conversation um, on on this this topic, and and uh, some of you on, on this call have heard me say before that it it's so so invigorating to have young interns, and and one college student who had not particularly studied the decorative arts said to me, "So is this just a big story of cultural appropriation?" And um, in a way, yes, and in a way, I think one has to really dissect that and think about the sort of history of artistic practice. And so um, it's easy to sort of dismiss and say, oh, well, they were just borrowing these things and they didn't understand or respect these cultures in the way that we would I expect um, artists and designers to do today and, and expect museums in their didactics and, and programming to do. And yet, his library is a fascinating clue to the fact that he was voracious in wanting to understand process. And yes, he's treating these things as sort of formalist in that they're sort of divorced from their use and their context. And so those, those are, are issues that very much are, are part of our, our current thinking about how you interpret people's responses and appropriation of of art and ideas from from cultures other than their own but but i think it's the story is is wonderfully and maddeningly very complicated and so our hope is that when the exhibition happens we can really have some some lively and challenging discussions about this because i do i do think this exhibition is very much about the whole creative process and as as you recall when we started meeting with our design team um, to think about the exhibition, they were enthralled by the fact that this is kind of what they do. And it was sort of the story of, of what they do. And so I think that informs to a certain extent, but I'd love to have you chime in too, because we have we have had a lot of discussions and we don't have any answers yet to how, how to reconcile um, contemporary discussions of cultural appropriation in, in any definitive way. Well, I think, as you said, it's, a, it's certainly an ongoing conversation and, and one that we continue to dig into and sort of pick apart in different parts. And, you know, you referenced um, Moore's library holdings with, in the absence of any direct correspondence from him, you know, we really don't have his written word or insight to base this assessment off of. Um, you know, the Grosjean diaries are incredibly helpful and sort of reveal and peel back a layer of that and show the immense respect that they had, not only for these physical objects and, and coming to understand them, but for their colleagues that they were interacting with from across the globe, as well in their expertise and learning from them and really sort of having this, um, you know, back and forth exchange that it really wasn't just a one way street of observation that they were really um, engaged with the material and the culture to some in some regards. Um, that I think we are we're sometimes quick to brush off in a contemporary context, like, oh, they didn't know what these objects were, or they didn't understand where they were coming from. And I think we are starting to get a better sense that, that might not have always been the case, at least with Moore and, um, and his colleagues. And uh, with that, Carrie, I think we're, uh, we'd love to open up to some other questions if, um, if there are any that have come through here. Yes, yes. we have a few, and that was a fascinating discussion. Um, and I'm going to start off with a question that came up in my mind when you were discussing um, that tea surface. Uh, I think you said it was owned by the Met and the New York Historical Society. Marian Pollock was asking, um, how can the tea set be held in two museum collections? Well, you know, we always like to make it complicated, but the Leffert service is um, owned between both us and the Museum of the City of New York. Uh, they own the, um, the larger jug that was pictured in that service. So we own three pieces, uh, four pieces if you include the tray, which isn't by Moore, but another um, English firm. Um, and then they own the fourth piece of the service. Yeah, so it's the, 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 right? 
Yeah, it's it's yeah. the age old story that somebody owned the tea set and and you know a, a niece got one one object or a, a a daughter or son got another. So over time, the the tea set was dispersed, and there that's that's all that um, we were able to assemble. And that photograph was taken in, in conjunction with uh, with the catalog for Art in the Empire City. But but so some of it ended up with different family members, and that's how some came to the Met and some went to the Museum of the City of New York. Fascinating. <laughs> Um, Lorraine asks, did Moore collect English ceramics? And if so, which manufacturers are represented in the collection at the Met? It's a great question. So one of the things we have kept in mind when we're looking at Moore's collection is, well, we, the Met received the majority of it. We know that there were some objects that were retained by the family. Um, and we don't know what all of those were. So in terms of what the Met received, we didn't receive any English ceramics. Um, so Short answer is no, he did not, to our knowledge. Madil, do you want to add a little to that? Yeah, so the, the, yeah. Bulk, of, the bulk of his collection did indeed come, um, come to the Met and no English ceramics came. Does that mean that he had some that he lived with and his family kept them possibly? And then one also has to bear in mind that there were certain things that he collected for Tiffany. So Tiffany had objects in their collection that were separate from, from his. So. Um, so the, the, sh the short answer is no, the longer answer is he certainly was very aware of them and we know he, he had um, some ceramic books, but apparently English ceramics were not, um, not his, his principal interest, I think we can safely conclude. Hmm. Um, Deidre Lewin asks, can you compare Tiffany to Bing in France? So in terms of comparison, I mean, Certainly, uh, Bing's aesthetic interests and and his interest in in Western Asian um, art and design they shared that um, we know that Moore spent a lot of time in Paris and would have been very familiar with Bing shop. I wish we could we had family letters and could document he visited on Wednesday the whatever and what he had to say. So we that we. We have to settle for a certain amount of, of speculation um, there, but um, but he he was the kinds of collections he was assembling and the French collectors with whom he had dealings allow us to say he would have been very familiar. And so, if if you think of if, for those of you who are familiar with with some of what what um, Bing was selling, you can certainly see similarities in some of particularly the Japanese uh, silver designs that Tiffany was producing at these moments that 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 sort of the energized negative space and asymmetrical compositions and all of that there there is certainly um, a resonance if that answers uh, Deirdre's question. Do you have anything more to add more? As I yeah, I mean, um, we also know that, you know, being acknowledged more individually in his own writings about what was going on in America and the American aesthetic movement. So, you know, they're clearly um, very familiar. We know William Moore, uh, his son, who was the art dealer, also had interactions with him. Um, so they were certainly uh, of the same time, place, and field, perhaps practicing in a slightly different manner. Um, you know, Moore wasn't actively retailing his own collection um, or, you know, facilitating that for others to our knowledge. So it's much more of a private individual and collector in that regard, whereas Bing was much more um, outward facing with his um, activism for that material. Um, Alex Mann asked, as someone with wide cultural interest and an active, and who is also an active traveler, do you know which foreign languages more spoke, if any? It's a great question. Uh, we can't definitively say, besides English, um, to our knowledge, but he most likely spoke French. Uh, we know his son travels to uh, France on behalf of Tiffany and works there for the remainder of his life or for a good chunk of it, um, being the head of the Paris shop for Tiffany's. Um, but the books in Moore's library completely range from in language. I mean, there's French, there's Italian, there's German, there's some other Northern European languages as well. There's some Russian um, that he spoke all of those languages. I don't think we can absolutely say, but um, he was certainly um, at least bilingual, most likely with French. Madil, do you think perhaps yeah, any others? What, well, well said, Laura. Sorry, is that me with all that weird feedback? Um, so, so we we don't we don't know, and, and 
my hope is that when this book comes out, somebody will emerge with letters that we wish we could have found earlier that will tell us more. But um, but he certainly um, was had passing um, ability to enjoy books in various languages. And as Maura said, uh, likely was spoke French and one of one of his sons lived his entire life um, in in Paris. Um, does Moore's library include design periodicals as well as books and sale, sales catalogs? So there are a couple um, serial periodicals that are included, um, but it was really interesting to compare Moore's library holdings with, as Medill alluded to, um, the Tiffany and Company as a firm also had their own small collection of art and library. Um, so a lot of the more periodical issues we found were in the Tiffany um, library holdings and that Moore's were, at least the ones that the Met received, were mostly auction catalogs. Um, reference materials, um, travel diaries of the like that had been published, um, very, but less heavy on the serial issued periodicals, but he certainly had access to them and, was, and they were widely available at the time for him. Yeah, no, exactly. The, the library uh, at Tiffany is, is a really, um, and they have a, an old catalog that we were able to sort of work back and, and with the help of some, um, some people who've done great work on their on their library sort of identify what periodicals were owned during Moore's tenure. So that piece is a really interesting one, but not reflected in what came to the Met. And is it the Tiffany Library where the Charles Grosjean diary came from? Or was that in the Met's collection? No. <laughs> Medill Medill help was like the integral part of this discovery, so I'll let her tell it. But well, no. <laughs> I, I I peeked at the visitors and I think I think I see that Spencer is, is still um on the call. So um interestingly, the Grosjean diaries and the Tiffany Technical Manual live at Brown because they're part of the Gorham um holdings and um they have uh, um, various different people have told me about them at, at, at different times before I dove into this project, in, in, including Spencer and, and Mark. And um, they, we don't know exactly how they got there. If you, if you, re if you read all of my uh, nitty gritty footnotes, you will learn that my theory is that, um, that Osborne, um, Grosjean was, was very close to him, was a, a mentor of one of the designers and silversmiths um, named Osborne. He ended up, he had worked at Whiting, came to Tiffany, went back to Whiting. Whiting got absorbed into Gorham. So I suspect that um, when Grosjean died, those things passed to Osborne and Osborne had them in his holdings and that's how they ended up at Gorham. There, there was a, a very popular, um, theory uh, that that it was a, a case of industrial espionage. Uh, the dates for that theory don't work with the dates of the book. So I can, although it's a lot sexier, it's not actually, um, doesn't hold up. <laughs> That's fascinating. And it just shows how important the decorative arts community is, especially when it comes to sleuthing and finding all this stuff. I mean, who knows where these kinds of documents are gonna end up. Okay. Um, who are the contemporaries of Moore in the U.S. in both collecting and design creation? Hmm. Ooh, another great question. Um, I'd say in terms of collecting, um, I mean, definitely people like Mary Morgan, who's maybe lesser known to some people today, but she, of course, had this incredible collection of Japanese art. Um, people like William Walters and his son. Um, those are sort of the of the moment people we know more is visiting with them that, you know, Mary Morgan, of course, is a client of Tiffany's um, and some of Moore's greatest designs are being purchased by her. Um, so they're sort of the contemporaries and I'll throw it to Medill for some of the other designers. Well, yeah, in, ter <laughs> in terms of collecting, it really is, um, he's ahead of his time in that the, the, the kinds of people who are collecting this material tend to be have Meyer era and 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 later and and in the case of all of our colleagues who were specialists in this material, they sort of confirmed that um, that he didn't have a lot of American contemporaries and most of the people collecting the way he was are are Europeans. But um, Maura quite rightly points out Mary Morgan is a really interesting um, contemporary and and Samuel Avery is is an important. Um, uh, American contemporary. And then in terms of um, 
design creation, um, Gorham and Whiting are, are very much going and, and competitive concerns at, at the same um, moment. And that's the, the story of this, this man, um, Osborne, who I mentioned. He talks about needing to leave Whiting because the only way he's going to get better at, um, at his craft is to study with more. So um, although everybody who works on these kinds of projects falls in love with their subject matter and, and is no longer impartial, I think it's fair to say that, that Moore was um, the, the, the leading design force at that moment, but he had plenty of competition and, um, and there were many, many others um, doing similar types of work, particularly at, at Gorham and um, to a certain extent at Whiting. Can you talk a little bit about the impact that this that the Edward C. Moore collection made on the Metropolitan at that time? I mean, were there other um, donors giving collections of this caliber and size and kind of what has been the resounding impact of, of this amazing group of objects? Um, so I'll start and then Maura, you pick up and I see another question that's right up Maura's alley that we want to have time for before we, we end. Um, so it, it was pretty unusual. There were, there were, there were sizable collections that were being given at about the same time. I think the, the scope and variety of his collection was singular and it came so early in the Met's history. And, and one thing that we haven't really talked about tonight, but it is um, discussed in, in the book is that Moore was very involved with the Met's efforts to start a, a school for, for um, design. And so this, this notion that, that these collections, the reason he wanted to give it to a museum is so that practicing artisans and craftspeople could educate themselves and improve their work by being exposed to these objects. So the, 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 the scope of the collection really was driven by that vision of what he wanted to achieve. And in that sense, he really is singular. There were, there were very focused collections um, ab about this early of, of some, um, certainly some Greek and Roman uh, glass collections and, um, and some Chinese uh, collections, but nobody had the sort of the range and certainly didn't have the, the sort of educational mission uh, in mind, if that's responsive. I think you really um, hit it on the head with the variety of his collection really wasn't matched by any other gifts around that same moment. Um, and also too, I mean, in terms of lasting legacy, I mean, th these were some of the foundational gifts for many of the departments that now exist at the Met. So before it was sort of all one, you know, Met collection and, and now it's been divided out into all these other departments. And really, I mean, especially in the Islamic art department, his objects are anchors of those galleries and really some of the most incredible masterpieces in our holdings. Um, so they're really just a, a great range. And then, you know, some of these um, European glass that he collected, maybe doesn't get as much glory these days as it once did, but is an incredibly rich collection and a variety and of time periods and manufacturers, both contemporary to more and historic objects. Um, and just have really shaped and at least this project I know, at least for us has helped our colleagues sort of revisit some of that work and um, see it in a new light. So it's been a really exciting way to engage with the collections some more. Yeah, in a way the men, sorry. sorry. The Met really was a collection of collections. So this kind of um, the breadth and size of the Moore collection was singular, but you had people who were donating painting collections. You didn't have specialized departments the way you do now. And instead you would have, you know, a collector would give a group of objects and they would be seen as a sort of manifestation of that collector's holdings. And, um, and so that, that whole like that, the Edward Moore room, that's that, that was, it was not singular. That was sort of how the collections were, were organized in those, those early days. But I'm gonna stop talking so we can get to some of these other questions. All right, um, did you find the connections between Moore and, any connections between Moore and Salviati? We did. Um, so <laughs> Moore's everywhere. You, um, for the most part, you give us a name, we could probably find that six degree of separation. But um, Tiffany and Company was actually retailing uh, some of the earliest Salviati productions. Um, and then there are some examples in Moore's collection of European glass um, that have been identified as such. And we also know that. Um, Salviati and other companies were replicating objects that 
exist in the Moore collection. Um, they may not have been in Moore's collection at the time that they were being recreated, but um, but they were known within the universe um, at that time. And so to see that Moore is also collecting objects that are being reproduced by contemporary um, artists and um, and uh, other decorative artists. It's just also really interesting to think about what he's collecting and how he's bringing it in. But yeah, more definitely had a connection to Salviati. Great. Well, I think that's all the questions we have time for, except for we have, I have two questions to wrap up. Um, uh, is there a final note on how people can stay up to date on when the exhibition will be happening? <laughs> I think Medill and I will be shouting it from the rooftops. <laughs> yes. So, so the the book will be um, it's it's going on press in a couple of weeks and will be in the in the bookstore and and available on Amazon and all of that stuff in June or July. And uh, so, yes, we we um, we did we just don't know. I mean, I think once we get through the the pandemic, part part of the plan if if you can call a lack of a plan a plan is that since this show was really pretty much done it can be slotted in as as availability um or as need arises so we will we will find as many vehicles for announcing that and it will certainly be on on the mets website but i i don't think it's going to be immediate which is why we push to have the book come out because we, we wanted this research to get out there and, and um, to be able to keep telling the stories we didn't get in the book, so. Great, well, everybody keep an eye on the Mets website and also the American Wings social pages. I'm sure that they will have lots of updates for you as uh, the more exhibition and publication become available and uh, I'm sure you'll be able to find it on Amazon, but always the Mets Bookstore is a wonderful resource that I can't recommend enough. So make sure you check that out. Maura, thank you so much for sharing your research. That was amazing. You are such an inspiring curator and it was so great to get to see you again. <laughs> and Madil, thank you for joining us as well. Um, this project is incredible and I'm just so glad we got to share it. I hope everyone um, who was able to join us tonight uh, enjoyed this wonderful dialogue and you will receive a link to a recording of this program in about a week um, and be sure to check out the decorative arts trust uh, website for updates on all of our upcoming program thank you both again and i hope everyone has a great night Thanks. bye all right thank you so much carrie thank you Medell. thanks maura you were fabulous <laughs>